My name is Jim Dean. I'm a pediatric audiologist in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Today, I'm going to introduce the topic of childhood hearing loss. But before doing so, I would like to acknowledge that this educational training video is the first of a series of videos on childhood hearing loss made possible by funding from the Arizona Department of Health Services. In this video, I will review the following topics. How common is infant and childhood hearing loss? What are major causes of hearing loss? What are the goals of newborn hearing screening programs? What are the components of early hearing detection and intervention programs? And what are the potential effects of hearing loss on early childhood development? How common is childhood hearing loss? In the United States, 33 babies are born every day with permanent hearing loss. It is estimated that 1.6 or almost 2 per thousand newborns will have a mild or greater degree of hearing loss in at least one year. Approximately 80% of all children born with, with hearing loss will have parents with normal hearing. And approximately one out of three children with hearing loss will have an additional disability. Some newborns have health factors that put them at a higher risk for hearing loss than well babies. For example, infants with greater than a five-day stay in a newborn intensive care unit, or NICU, are ten times more likely to have hearing loss than well babies. The National Institute on Deafness and Communication Disorders estimates that one in 100 graduates of a NICU will have hearing loss. Infants with syndromes, such as Down syndrome, are also known to be at a higher risk for hearing loss. What are some causes of early childhood hearing loss? Damage to or malformation of the auditory system can have a genetic or non-genetic cause. Genetic hearing loss is the result of an atypical gene code passed on by the biologic parents. Spontaneous changes in genetic code can also occur during the very early stages of pregnancy during the embryonic period. Approximately 50% of childhood hearing loss is genetic in origin. How is genetic hearing loss described? 70 to 80% of genetic hearing loss does not have other signs or symptoms associated with it, and they are called non-syndromic. 20 to 30% of genetic hearing loss will have additional abnormalities and are called syndromic. It is important to note that non-syndromic and syndromic hearing loss may occur at any age because it can be delayed in its onset. What are other causes of early childhood hearing loss? Approximately 50% of early childhood hearing loss is non-genetic in origin. Non-genetic hearing loss may be classified as environmental because the hearing loss is the result of something that occurred in the child's prenatal environment. Non-genetic hearing loss may also be called idiopathic because the cause is unknown. Some prenatal environmental causes of childhood hearing loss include viral or bacterial infections, such as toxoplasmosis or cytomegalovirus, maternal sensitivity to certain drugs or, medic or medications prescribed during pregnancy can also lead to hearing loss. Other causes of, of environmental hearing loss include fetal exposure to alcohol, injury, and trauma. Some prenatal maternal health conditions can cause prematurity, which can result in a long stay in the NICU for the newborn. Remember that one in approximately 100 graduates of a NICU will have hearing loss. What are some of the possible effects of hearing loss? Four possible major effects can result from childhood hearing loss. Delay in the development of receptive and expressive communication skills, that is speech and language. Language deficit, leading to learning problems and reduced academic achievement, communication difficulties leading to social isolation and poor self-concept, and reduced vocational choices. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention classifies hearing loss as a disability because untreated hearing loss has the potential for limiting independence, communication, and personal achievement throughout life. When these effects of hearing loss are present, and untreated, without the benefit of adequate accommodation, they are an expression of an auditory or communication disability. 
Time of onset is a critical factor in the long-term effects of hearing loss. Some terms that would be helpful for you to know to understand time of onset include congenital, hearing loss present at birth, acquired, hearing loss that occurs sometimes after birth, prelingual, hearing loss that occurs before the development of language, and postlingual, hearing loss that occurs after the development of language. How can the adverse effects of childhood hearing loss be minimized? Early hearing detection and intervention programs play a crucial role in minimizing the adverse effects of childhood hearing loss. The goal of any programs is to ensure that all infants and toddlers with hearing loss are identified as early as possible and provided with timely and appropriate audiologic, educational, and medical intervention. This definition of the goals of EDI was obtained through the National Center for Hearing Assessment and Management. How is hearing loss detected early? Newborn hearing screening programs are an integral part of EDI programs. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, newborn hearing screening is, an accurate, is accurate and leads to early identification and treatment of, hear, of infants with hearing loss. Newborn hearing screenings are done in all 50 states and U.S. territories. Many state programs receive funding federally through the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Act of 2010. How early can hearing screenings be done? Ideally, newborn hearing screenings are done before a newborn is discharged from the hospital nursery or birthing center. Newborns who are not screened soon after birth need to have their hearing screenings done by one month. How many newborn screenings are done? In the United States in 2009, there were over 4 million births, and of these births, 97% had a hearing screen. In Arizona in 2009, there were 93,000 births, and approximately 98% of, of these births had hearing screens. It is also known that in Arizona, of those newborn screenings that were done, 1.23 in 1,000 newborns were confirmed to have hearing loss. How are babies screened for hearing loss? Currently, there are two types of hearing screenings that can be done quickly to evaluate the function of the auditory system while a baby is resting or asleep. Evoked autoacoustic emissions is one test, and the second, automated auditory brainstem response. How do evoked autoacoustic emissions hearing screens work? When a healthy ear responds to a sound, small hair cells in the inner ear generate sound vibrations called evoked autoacoustic emissions. During an evoked autoacoustic emissions hearing screening, a probe is placed into the ear canal and soft sounds are presented. After sounds are presented, a tiny microphone detects the small sound vibrations that return from deep within the inner ear. When the inner ear is healthy, evoked autoacoustic emissions will be present, and the test result is a pass. When the inner ear is damaged, the evoked autoacoustic emissions will be absent, and the test result will be a refer. Evoked autoacoustic emissions are not hearing tests. They cannot predict the softest sounds at which a baby can hear. However, when evoked autoacoustic emissions are present, it is likely that no worse than a mild hearing loss is present. And when evoked autoacoustic emissions are absent, it is likely that a mild or greater hearing loss exists. How does automatic auditory brainstem response screening work? The automatic ABR involves attaching small electrodes to the baby and presenting a soft clicking sound to each ear. If electrical activity from the hearing nerve is recorded for each ear, such as you see in the black panel in the, in the top right, the auditory system is healthy and the screening test results in a pass. If electrical ac activity is not recorded, the result is a refer. What are the follow-up procedures for a newborn hearing screening? Any newborn or infant that refers on either type of newborn hearing screening twice may have a mild or greater hearing loss, which requires a referral to an audiologist for a comprehensive hearing evaluation. Is there a recommended timeline for follow-up? The current goals for timely implementation of EDI are part of the National Institutes of Health Healthy People 2010 initiative. 
three goals are set. Hearing screening prior to discharge from hospital and no later than one month. Confirmation of the type and degree of hearing loss no later than three months. And the initiation of early intervention including the fitting of appropriate ampl amplification if parents elect to use it no later than six months of age. The current NIH goals are typically referred to as the 136 plan. In video two, you will learn more about the 136 plan and about the role that audiologists play in minimizing the potentially adverse effects of hearing loss on early childhood development. Now let's look back and see if we can answer these questions. How common is newborn hearing loss nationally? Approximately two per 1,000 births. What are the two main categories of etiology for congenital hearing loss? Genetic and non-genetic. What are two types of tests used for hearing screenings? Evoked autoacoustic emissions and automated ABR. True or false, a pass on a hearing screening means normal hearing. False. What does EDI mean? Early hearing detection and intervention. The resources that we access for this presentation are shown here and in the next slide. These resources will also be available at the University of Arizona Speech, Language, Hearing, and Sciences website for your review. Thank you for your attention.